Hello and welcome to lecture number 32. Today we're covering topic 4.4, America on the world stage. And the theme that we're looking at is America in the world. We have one learning objective today. It is explain how and why American foreign policy developed and expanded over time. The first of two key concepts is struggling to create an independent global presence. The United States sought to claim territory throughout the North American continent and promote foreign trade. The United States was struggling to stay neutral during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. This spans the presidency of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Both Britain and France are harassing American ships at sea, but Britain is impressing U.S. sailors. That means that they were abducting them from their ships and then forcing them to work in the British Navy ships. Jefferson responds with the Embargo Act of 1807. It cuts off all trade with Great Britain from 1807 until 1809 as a way to try and punish Britain for their actions. The U.S. ends up being hurt more, as they were a more valuable trading partner to us than we were to them. The embargo was extremely unpopular, as you see on the top left a political cartoon depicts the Democratic Republicans being criticized for hurting the economy. Britain continues to impress American sailors on merchant ships headed to France, so the act didn't even accomplish what it set out to do. In the early months of 1809, James Madison is inaugurated as president. He had been the Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson, so his actions were aligned with that of the Jefferson administration. His reaction to the British actions at sea was the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809. It was similar to the Embargo Act in that it cut off trade with Britain, but now France is included in the embargo. The Non-Intercourse Act is wildly unpopular, as the only party that was hurt by the act was the United States. So Congress steps in with a possible solution. Their response is Macon's Bill No. 2. In it, they promised that the U.S. was going to restore trade to whichever side pledged to respect American shipping overseas, and eventually oppose the belligerent nation that didn't. Napoleon saw this as a great opportunity. He sent word to James Madison that France will be the one who will respect the United States' neutrality, and thus the U.S. should take an aggressive stance towards Great Britain. Madison took Napoleon's bait and implements a more aggressive stance against Great Britain. Yet Napoleon and the French did not change their behavior when it came to American ships heading to Great Britain. So it was kind of a failure because it didn't accomplish the freedom of the seas for American merchants, and it drew the United States ever closer to the eventual War of 1812. The next key concept says, The U.S. government sought influence and control over the Western Hemisphere through a variety of means, including military actions, American Indian removal, and diplomatic efforts such as the Monroe Doctrine. The first military action the U.S. is involved in is the War of 1812. The U.S. declares war over violations of neutrality rights as American merchant ships were harassed at sea. A section of Democratic Republicans who were young, up-and-comer politicians, mostly from the South, strongly called for a declaration of war against Britain. Their faction was called the War Hawks, or more plainly, Hawks. The Federalists were not in favor of a war with Great Britain. As you may remember, the Federalists had a better relationship with Great Britain and wanted closer economic ties with them. Additionally, they knew that Britain was the stronger power. They could sustain a war effort for longer, while the United States barely had the capacity to manufacture the goods necessary for war. But they had lost influence in Congress and do not get their way. The Federalists, who were understandably fearful of Great Britain, feared that they could lose their independence that was so hard fought in the previous century. The more optimistic war hawks saw it as an opportunity to expel the British from North America and gain territory in Canada. When the war begins, the United States begins to engage the British in Canada, but that goes poorly for the United States. They are repelled, and the British put in place a blockade around the United States, which hurts the economy. The British attacks through the Chesapeake Bay into Washington, D.C., and the British win a major victory in D.C., which ends with the White House being burnt down. James Madison and his wife Dolly Madison basically have to flee the presidential residence and grab anything they think valuable and mobile to preserve. Dolly Madison actually saves a portrait of George Washington that was hanging in the White House. For the most part, the war is fought to a stalemate in the northeast of the United States, with some success in the south. As the war was ending, Andrew Jackson successfully defends and defeats the British in the Battle of New Orleans. However, the military victory happened about two weeks after the peace treaty had been signed in the Treaty of Ghent. There are some extensions to the War of 1812 that include Native Americans who had allied with the British. For example, the Shawnee will fight against the U.S. under the Shawnee Chief Tecumseh. There are also separate military conflicts that the U.S. engages in against Native Americans in the 1810s. Andrew Jackson, after the War of 1812, was ordered to pursue Seminoles who would lead raids into Georgia and take shelter in Spanish Florida. 
Jackson takes the unilateral decision to take U.S. troops into Spanish territory to destroy Seminole villages. He seized Florida by driving out the Spanish governor and causes a diplomatic crisis when he captures and executes two British agents. He took his orders from Monroe and went beyond what he had been asked to do. The incident forced Spain to sell Florida to the United States through the adams onis Treaty of 1819. Now for diplomatic efforts. The Treaty of Ghent ends the War of 1812. The painting on the slide shows John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, shaking hands with the British Foreign Minister. There was no territorial gain or loss by either side. The British were pretty tired of fighting wars, and the conflict in Europe was winding down since Napoleon had been banished to the island of Elba at this time. The rush Bago Agreement is another treaty that the U.S. makes with Great Britain. It establishes that the fortifications will be limited along the U.S. and Canada border. Later, the Treaty of 1818 sets the 49th parallel as the border between the United States and British Canada, west of the Minnesota Territory. The map on the screen shows that the U.S. gains a little bit of territory that was not part of the original Louisiana Purchase as a result of that treaty. Finally, in 1819, after Andrew Jackson had driven out the Spanish governor, the U.S. purchased Florida from the Spanish. The Spanish, for their part, were struggling to maintain their empire in the Americas and trying to limit revolutions from occurring across Mexico and South America. With Mexican independence in 1821, the Spanish are expelled from North America. The biggest Indian resistance movement of this time period is led by Tecumseh and his younger brother, Tezcatawa, who was known as the Prophet. Tecumseh led the Shawnee Confederacy, which started as a result of the Treaty of Fort Wayne. The territory that the treaty partitioned is modern-day Indiana. The territorial governor, William Henry Harrison, gets approval for the treaty from the Native American groups that occupied the region, except the Shawnee who only partially occupied the territory. Tecumseh takes up arms on the grounds that the treaty did not gain consent from all parties affected by it, and the conflict becomes called Tecumseh's War. The war becomes part of the larger conflict of the War of 1812 as Tecumseh allies with the British. However, Tecumseh is killed in battle in 1815, so this movement ends after the war. One of the most significant battles in this war occurs in 1811, while Tecumseh is still traveling, recruiting members to the Confederacy. At the Battle of Tippecanoe, William Henry Harrison marched to Tecumseh's headquarters at Prophetstown to take advantage of his absence. Confederacy troops take the offensive and attack Harrison first. After sustaining the initial offensive, Harrison and his troops pushed back the attack and eventually burnt down Prophetstown, along with all their food stores for the winter. The Confederacy sustains the fighting until 1815, but was badly hurt by the defeat at Tippecanoe. Alternatively, Harrison gains military fame for his part and leverages his fame in the 1840 presidential election. Andrew Jackson was also heavily involved in American Indian relations. After the War of 1812, he was a treaty negotiator in the Southeast, trying to get tribes to give up more territory. He is successful in gaining concessions from the Chickasaw and Choctaw in his home state of Tennessee. At this point, the U.S. begins to offer lands west of the Mississippi in exchange for Indian lands occupied in the Southeast. This will culminate with what becomes known as the Indian Removal Act, which offered the same type of deal, but was forcibly implemented through the Trail of Tears in the 1830s. Lastly, the Monroe Doctrine was a response to the other European powers in the Western Hemisphere. The Spanish were already losing their influence, but there was a question over how much effort they would try to put in to regain their lost colonies. Russia was also making their way down from Alaska through the Pacific coast. They had made it as far south as San Francisco. President James Monroe puts forth a new foreign policy crafted by his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, that any European power with the intention of colonizing the Western Hemisphere is going to have to answer to the United States first. The United States didn't really have the naval power or the firepower to back up their threats. The U.S. was actually relying on Great Britain heavily in backing up our policy because Great Britain still had Canada, and they also did not want any other European rivals in North America or the Western Hemisphere. Monroe and Adams knew that if they put out a very strong statement, that it would have backing from Britain because it was mutually beneficial to their own interests. So here's the recap for today. The United States tried to maintain its neutrality at sea, but tensions escalated into war. That war was the War of 1812. It was not a great success for the United States, but it solidified its place in the world stage and it showed that it could stand up against Great Britain, generating a great deal of nationalism. There's more expansion into the Western Territory, there's the addition of Florida that pushes out American Indians, and finally, the Monroe Doctrine warns Europeans to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. The power of the U.S. to enforce this was less clear, yet they were really relying on Great Britain as an ally to help enforce it. 
Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.